going to do this live virtual discussion on a little melody that I've been working on for this last week. This is a major seven sharp nine melody. And I've been singing it through this entire week just to learn to hear it. And then I also have been playing it after I sang it for a while. I played it on my tenor through all the keys. And I played it in these various rhythmic locations in the bar, in this two-bar phrase. So you can see in the PDF, I practice it on beat one as eighth notes and a one as eighth notes, and then triplets on beat one, second triplet of beat one, and last triplet of beat four, like a pickup. Um, so I'm just going to walk through this process of practicing, and if there's questions, I can answer them as best I can. So the first thing I did was conceive of the, the melody, and it starts off with kind of a, a cliche. In A, here's this melody here. So it goes major 7. in my mind, audiating it, hearing it in my mind, I would be thinking of it in a key and then maybe understanding what the fingerings were in my instrument, saxophone, um, and maybe the numbers, kind of understanding where those notes exist in this A major sound. So, one, seven, one, three, five, six, or thirteen, nine, seven, sharp, eleven, sharp, nine, major, seven, three, Ba da 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 ba. I keep wanting to go to sharp eleven there. Ba da 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 da. So I did that for the last week. Uh, just I made this uh, recording that I could sing along to in the car. So I sang it in the car. You know. Uh, probably 30 minutes every time I drove. Here's what the play along sounds like so you get a sense of that. This is a MIDI. So really slow so I could sing along and match pitch. I usually make these little sing-along ear training uh, practice uh, mp3s in finale. The bass is playing half notes, piano is playing a uh, voicing, third and seven in this case, and then the, the melody is played by a flute. 
It's fairly decent sounding for practicing. And the sustain of the flute allows you to really match pitch with your voice. So I did that for quite a while, and then I started thinking about while singing it in one key, since I don't have perfect pitch, I can just sing it in one key and visualize it in all 12 keys. So I did that for a while uh, in my mind, with my fingers and my voice, before I played it on my saxophone. So by the time I brought it to the saxophone, I already knew it in all the keys and could play it with no mistakes right away. Um, that said, once I sped up the, the melody a little bit on the saxophone, I did start making some mistakes built on because of muscle memory. So oftentimes we practice this arpeggio going instead of from the 5th to the 6th or 5th to the 13th, we go from the 5th to the major 7th. And sure enough, when I started playing it too fast and not really using my ear, my fingers wanted to just go E, G sharp, B and just play that major 7. So once again, the curse of muscle memory, um, it's nice to be able to play fast, but it can, do, it can be a detriment to your actual ability to connect with your ear um, in real time. So something to consider. Okay, so, like I said, next thing I did was start to play it on my horn. And what I did was just played it a uh, rubato on my horn, not with any rhythm, uh, just to, you know, get comfortable with the melody. So that sounds like this. So I'll play it in my A on tenor to start. That's concert G. <laughs> got comfortable in that key and then I'd go to the next key and again this is without rhythm I'm playing it you know fairly evenly as eighth notes and I'm hearing it as eighth notes on beat one but I'm just not worrying about time right now I'm just worried about getting the, the sound in my fingers and on the horn so the next concert C key <laughs> myself to slur in order so that I can hear any discrepancies in my technique, which there's quite a bit of. And so by slurring, you really hear your finger technique clearly, and you can hear all the little errors in, uh, you know, those neural pathways and how those, uh, th that muscle, those muscles are triggered. So I'll, again, slurring it in concert. <laughs> So just nice and relaxed at a tempo where you have control of the line in your mind. You're hearing it and you're knowing the shape and little, very little room for error, hopefully. And then, of course, you're noticing, uh, being aware of the finger technique issues. <laughs> That right there, G up to C, 
I get like a flam effect because this ring finger is slightly behind. <laughs> if I can use my wrist a little bit and lift to that C from the G to the C, it helps with that uh, slow response. Still audible. Okay, so the next key now, concert D flat. if I'm going to use the bis key and do the rolling from bis to B or if I'm going to use the side key which would technically be more correct. Here's with the bis. <laughs> on this PDF uh, rubato and not worrying about the time. So next I started working on it in time using this displacement strategy that I used on the last stream I was demonstrating with our altered idea. So here's my metronome. So I'll, turn, I'll bring it up to about, again this isn't about speed, it's just about getting more familiar with the idea more comfortable with it and becoming more deeply involved in the idea so that eventually it becomes an intuitive idea that you sing in the moment through your instrument. So you're trying to kind of get it to that point. So here's in time on the B. <laughs> Uh, in the 
this harmonic rhythm. One, two, three, four. <laughs> So now move to the triplet. So this would be triplets on beat one. Triplet, 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 triplet. One, two, three, four. <laughs> triplet and eighth note variations through all the keys on your instrument. Nice and slow like that. Uh, I think the sweet spot is 80% success. So if you're going, if you're making a few mistakes, 20% failure is fine. It's, it's giving you some cognitive dissonance that will help you learn it. Um, but any more than that and you're just practicing it too fast and you're basically practicing as, as much wrong as you are right. So, you know, you do want a uh, repetition to create depth of understanding, uh, especially in terms of audiating and hearing the idea. So we talked a bit about audiation last uh, stream. I'll bring it up again here. And the way I add that into this equation is, of course, just practicing it on the couch. I'll be sitting on the couch with coffee, and I'll just listen to the idea in my mind once I can hear it and think of it in whatever key I think I'm in. I don't know what key I'm in because I don't have perfect pitch, but Using relative pitch, I hear the idea in my mind, and I uh, think of the fingering, sometimes literally in my hand. Sometimes I'm like moving my hands like this, like most saxophone players do. We practice with our hands. Or other times I'm just hearing it in my mind and knowing the fingerings. It's almost like I'm imagining those, imagining doing this, but not actually moving my fingers. And then sometimes it's a little bit of each, like the fingers are slightly moving now and then as I'm thinking of it. But... If you can audiate while you're doing this, it's much more powerful than if you're just moving your fingers um, using the math and understanding of the, of the melody. It's better if you can hear the melody, even if it's really faint. So my audiation skill is, I would say, not loud, and um, it's, but it, it is uh, possible for me to hear. So I can hear the melody quietly in my mind, and I need to go slower um, than... I need to go slow to do it. So I usually am playing pretty slow in my mind when I'm practicing audiation. One way to do it with your instrument is you play the phrase once and then you try to audiate it the second time. So if I do that here, um, the first example, eighth notes on beat one, I'll play it once and then I'll imagine it once. Audiated pretty clearly, and then you can 
you can do the repetitions many times without playing. So you can play it once and then audiate it many times in your mind. Especially good for someone like me who has, you know, RSI issues, carpal tunnel syndrome, and tendonitis since 1990. This is a great resource for me, and it's how I do most of my practicing. So uh, that would be basically how to incorporate uh, audiation in a more um, responsible way with more uh, diligence in your practice. Plus, it, you know, it definitely helps foster the use of space, the idea of playing something and then reflecting, um, as opposed to just playing it over and over with no space uh, and kind of driving yourself crazy in the practice room. It's a very good habit so that when you get on the bandstand, you have that uh, peace of mind and perspective that allows you to leave some space in your solo, um, even if it's just a brief moment. <laughs> All space is appreciated, I think. Um, okay, so that's basically the idea uh, we can talk about something else now if this is um, if there's no questions uh, regarding this particular melody. I guess the next step would be putting this into a song so that you can begin to think about it in the context of performance or using it. And you know, I'm not a big fan of plug and play, but it can be a valuable part of the process. So what I will usually do if I'm trying to practice uh, integrating an idea like this, almost like plug and play, is that I will play, I will pick a tune, and I will use this for one section of the tune, and then I will do something more improvised for the rest of the piece. And uh, when I say more improvised, I mean I always try to practice with some sort of restriction. So, for instance, if I were, the, you know, in this concert G, if this is concert G in my A major, I might think of it over um, out of nowhere. You know, the first two bars of Out of Nowhere is my A major. Or uh, it could be uh, I play East of the Sun in Concert G or my A major. I could play this over East of the Sun. The uh, problem would be that the C sharp in bar 2 would have to become a C natural if I played D7 in bar 2, which I do, Concert C7. And then, uh, but if I played it in triplets, I could squeeze it all in in one bar. Uh, I could also do it over, I remember, April, which is four bars of A major. Um, and so that could be a nice place to practice this. And there's a lot of open A major in that tune. So I could play this every time I got to that first uh, of, of the main sections, every time I got to that four bars of A major, I could play this idea in some way, maybe with one of the displacement ideas or uh, maybe just freely improvise with the shape and change the rhythm uh, spontaneously. So that might be a good a good way to start using this. Thanks for joining and see you next time.